morning, church. How are you today? My name is Terry, for all of you that don't know me, and I've been coming since we launched this church, 2016. I've been invited to share my testimony this morning, to let you know where I came from and where I am now, and trust me, where I came from was not very pleasant. I like to joke around, I like to play caught up. Everybody knows me, just I'm a prankster, but one thing I've learned that my love for the Lord, I get very serious and very passionate about. Growing up, I was far, far from God. I never knew church. I never knew people went to church. Nobody was there to guide me in any way or nothing. So growing up as a child, didn't do nothing but cause trouble and get in trouble. A uh, young adult, my early years, adulthood, just uh, typical partying, drinking, drugs, fighting, just kind of a troublemaker, but not too bad. Just was so lost for such a long time, and the devil kept me, he just kept me down. He was telling me everything I wanted to hear, so I thought it was all right, but it wasn't. In 2011, God got in my head, and he said, you know what, that's it, that's enough. He sent me my wife. We met, and I didn't know at the time what was happening, but felt something so we did a long distance relationship for about a year she lived in Michigan I lived here and after that year she said you know she left her family her friends her career and she moved here to be with me it made me so happy but in turn I didn't really grow up Still, first few years we were together, it was hard. We struggled. She had her ways. I had my ways. But I wasn't going to budge. No. Things not to be proud of, the way I treated her and other loved ones, because I had a temper. I had a foul mouth. And I didn't care about really nobody but me. So she kind of told me one day, let's, let's try going to church. Okay, we'll try it. I had it in my head. I'm already mad because that was the only day I had to sleep in. So we went around to some different churches, and I made it miserable for her. I wasn't going back. I didn't even want her to drag me around, but she kept on it. One day I came home from work and she got a postcard in the mail about a new church that's going to start. She was excited. Will you go? It's a couple weeks, you know. Yeah, I'll go. I figured I had two weeks to mess everything up so she wouldn't want me to go. We're going down the road. We see the billboard for Restore. She's all excited. Oh, man, look, that's the church. Yay. So that morning... We're getting ready to go to church. And I told her, I'm not dressing any certain way. I'm wearing my Harley shirt and my jeans. And everybody's just going to judge me. And they're going to want money. And they're going to want this. That's just how I felt all the time. I didn't know. I didn't know. So all the, the whole ride down to to the church I complained it, it just wasn't a pleasant ride and she's strong she didn't say a word I was hoping she would so I could just turn around and go home we got there and I pulled up in front of the sports hall of fame and I thought to myself wow they don't even have a building you know I didn't know you didn't need a building for the church. I didn't know that this right here, us being in one place, no matter where it is, was the church. 
So on our way up to the door, people are out greeting while I sing this big guy, David Kromberg, who I had met just a couple weeks before then. He worked at the Harley dealership, and I was in there doing some stuff, buying parts, and we talked briefly. But anyway, he was greeting. He was part of the Restore Launch. So that made it a lot more easier for me to get in there. And I figured, you know, this big biker guy, you know, the place is all right for him. It's got to be all right for me. So we went in. And all the way in there, I mean, just people just welcoming, glad you're here. It's just so nice. I met Pastor Kevin that morning. And to this day, he's probably one of my best friends. We've got a great relationship, and his family and us are close, and I love them all. Then I seen Pastor Mark, which it always sticks in my head, and I hope you don't, it's not a mess. I just, I seen him, he was just so young. He was a little kid, you know, and he was walking across, and I'm like, he struck me as one of those GQ models, like in the magazine. You know, he just, he was styling. He, he just, he always does. But I went in, and we listened, and we worshiped, and, well, I stood there. We listened to the sermon. We were leaving, and it really wasn't that bad. So Jenny asked me, would I go back again? I said, sure. So we started attending regularly. In April 10th, 2016, after going for a few months, uh, we were leaving, but I couldn't physically put the key in the ignition that morning. And I know when people say they have visions or they hear voices, they hear God. I didn't, there was none of that. But for some reason, I, I really, I couldn't leave. And I didn't know why. I told Jenny that I had to go find Pastor Kevin or Pastor Mark or somebody. And I didn't know what I was feeling. Found Kevin took me in the one classrooms and we talked and he said that's the Holy Spirit tugging in your heartstrings I don't know really what he's talking about I know I liked it so I said well what do I do now he said well your next step is accepting Christ if you're ready that's what I am so he went and got Mark and all three of us one of the best times of my life all three of us guys we sat there and prayed with me and over me, and I accepted Jesus Christ that day. And after that, I just had such a feeling come over me. I was just, I got on fire. I wanted everything I could about the Lord. I wanted to know everything. Whew. It's a lot biggest things moving forward from that day five months later when me and my wife we both got baptized on the same day after that even kind of before that I had quit cussing don't know when I'd quit drinking I'd quit acting like a fool all the time instead of just some of the time and I just started having compassion for people I never had before. And I tell the story a lot because I used to be one of those guys and I'm sorry, when I seen homeless people I'm thinking to myself, I can work, I gotta pay rent, I gotta buy groceries why can't they? They can get a job but now I know it's more than just somebody standing there wanting more. They, we don't know their story we gotta find their story out you know So I'd like to know that just not judging people all the time by what you see. See, I used to think Christians would judge me because the way I looked and all. They seen a broken person. They seen somebody that's going through things. I was the one quick to judge them. I never knew better. Never knew better. But I'm saying that to say this, that where you come from 
could be a dark and evil place, but accepting Jesus Christ and moving forward, the joy you feel, the love, the transformation of your heart, it's real, and I love it. I just want to say, if there's anybody here that feels the way I used to, just thinks all this is kind of a, a big show, come talk to me. I'll tell you the real thing of it. It's real. I love the Lord. He loves me. And if there's ever any questions, you find me, anybody, we can get all the guys together. We can have a party and get you taken care of, get you on the path where you need to be. Because once you start going the way Jesus wants you to live, wants you to just follow his footsteps, you will have such an amazing, joy-filled life you'll never understand. So thank you. is good and all the time amen amen hasn't it been a great morning this morning it's been a great morning this morning um welcome to restore church this morning before you're seated go ahead and shake somebody's hand and tell them one thing you're grateful for this morning
right, as you make your way back to your seats, like I said, welcome, welcome to Restore Church this morning. Um, if you are new here or if you've been here a million times, whether you're watching online or you're here in person, we want to welcome you here. We are so excited that you've chosen to worship with us today. My name is Karina, and I get to serve here on staff with the worship ministry, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome you today. We are a church that believes in connecting, right? We believe in iron sharpening iron and growing together. Um, we want you to know that you're not only loved by us, but you're loved by an infinite God who cares about you and who has a purpose for your life. And different ways that we're able to do that is as seen on the screen. You can scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you. You can text the word CONNECT to 757-530-5990, or you can fill out the CONNECT card like this that's in the seat back in front of you. And all three of those ways, you will receive a link that gives you more and more information about um, Restore Church, what we believe, um, what we have here. We have Life Track. Can I hear it for Life Track in the room? All right. Yeah, we have two more than we had last service. That's great. Everybody's excited. We also have small groups. They're about to start up here in a couple of weeks, I believe. Um, and the Young Adult Small Group is the best small group. Thank you, Megan. I hear that. Awesome. And so if you have any questions about how you can get connected, um, whether it's with the worship ministry or the young adults group, I would be happy to talk to you about it after service. Um, the last time I was here, I talked to you guys about something that I'm really, really not good at, planting. It's not my thing. I'm very impatient. I'm going to give you a positive thing this time and say that I love to teach. I think I'm pretty good at it. I teach fifth grade. Um, uh, all the, oh, thank you. Hey. Okay. I take a boost of confidence. Um, yeah, so I teach fifth grade, and we normally have Bible classes every single day, but on Fridays we have a Q&A day. And let me tell you, there are some questions about heaven I cannot answer. I say, I'll, I'll let you know when I see it. So when we're all up there, we'll see it together. Um, or questions about revelation that still confuse me. So we kind of wrestle through that together, but the whole point is that I get to see how they are wrestling with the scripture for themselves. They're reading it, they're digesting it, they're thinking about it, and that's what God calls us to do. And so one of the things we've been talking about here recently is the fact that love and trust go, to, go hand in hand. They are together, right? You can't have love without trust, right? You can say that you love something or someone, but if you don't trust them, those are just words. That's what we've been going over. In the same way, you can say that you love God and not trust him with your material things, not trust him with your time, not trust him with your energy, not trust him with rest, right? To be fully rejuvenated for the next week, right? And so I wonder what God is really encouraging you to do, even in this time, to trust him with, whether it's trusting him with your time, trusting him with the courage to talk to that person that really gets on your nerves at work, in your neighborhood, wherever it is, right? Or trusting him with your finances. We'll see in a minute, we're going to be able to worship through giving. And so if God is calling you or Holy Spirit is calling you, I ask that you would think about that and pray about that even now. Um, there are different ways that you can give and um, by cash or check online at restore.church slash give through cash app, any of those ways, texting the number on the screen as well. But I challenge you to give out of obedience, not out of obligation. Amen. All right, let's pray today. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all the things that you've done for us this week. Lord, I don't know what anybody's week has looked like, but Lord, I thank you for being there in the times of joy, and I thank you for being there in the times of heartache and pain and disappointment and brokenness and mental struggle, God. I ask that you would cover each and every person in this room, God. Bless them abundantly, Lord. Give them a peace that passes all understanding, Jesus. I pray that you'll be with the giving today and the giver, Lord. Bless them both, Lord. Help them to go to the furtherance of your kingdom, Pray that you be with Pastor Mark as he brings the word. Convict us where we need convicting and encourage us where we need encouraging. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. J. Arthur Rank was an English executive. He actually worked in the film and movie industry, before that owned a large company. But he's also a Christian. 
And he had a lot of things that often weighed his mind down, so he made a decision that on Wednesdays he would choose to worry. He decided that all of his worries would be consumed on Wednesday. So anytime something came up that tempted him to worry, he would write it down on a piece of paper and put it in a box on his desk. And then on Wednesday morning, he would open that box and go through the previous seven days' items of worry that he had refused to worry about, and now he would allow himself a few hours to commiserate and worry. After a few weeks, the interesting thing was that every Wednesday, by the time he would open the worry box, he found that most of the things he'd written down were already settled. There was no point in worrying about them anymore. They'd been dealt with. He discovered what most of us know, and that is often the things we worry about don't happen or resolve themselves without us getting involved too much. So I want to ask you, what's something you're constantly worried about? Or even right now, it's just pressing on your mind. Is it a sin to worry? If so, what do we do about it? And let me ask it this way. Why does God care if I worry? Because here's, here's where I get. God, adultery, bad. Lying, bad. Stealing, bad. Hating, bad. But Jesus goes farther than just murder. He's like, even hate. Okay, okay. He's like, adultery, bad. Also lust. We're like, oh, okay, okay, all right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's bad to steal, but it's also bad to be greedy. And we're like, whoa, Jesus really going for the internal. And then Jesus says, don't worry. Wait a minute. Worry? Is that such a big deal? Does it really matter that much? And if so, why does, it, why does it matter to you, Jesus? Leo Buscaglia said it this way, worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. Do you know what Jesus is really saying? I don't want you to live that way. I want a better way for you. Not just so you feel better, but so that you can live better, so that you can do better, so that you can make a difference. I just want to share with you some of the things we're worried about. In America, according to a 2022 study, United States adults are most worried about, number one, 70% were anxious about keeping themselves or their families safe. 68% were anxious about keeping their identity safe. That's a new one. That's the last few years. 66% were anxious about their health. 65%, their bills or expenses being paid. 59%, the impact of climate change. 50%, the opioid dynamic. 45%, emerging technology and its impact on day-to-day -day life. Some of these are new, but some of these have been the worry of everyone for all of human existence. Your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was probably also worried about keeping his family safe. Maybe it weren't, wasn't robbers breaking in. Maybe it was bears because they lived in the woods, but they were afraid of something. Did you notice that all of the things I laid out in those statistics, our worry begins with a desire for control mixed with a fear of the unknown. This is what worry tells us. Hey, if I worry about it, maybe I'll have a little more control. You won't. I'm worried because I want control and I want to know what tomorrow brings. And this is the desire of every human heart, to have ultimate control. This is why we do our best to, to eliminate all possible risk, all possible suffering, all possible death, all possible things that are actually you can't do anything about. And then when we can't do those things, if, if bad things are going to happen, we want to know about it. Uh, I want to make sure that I see it coming. And the, the frailty and the brokenness of human nature is we can't see it coming. We can't know the future. And even if we could, we couldn't control it. Jesus knew this. He knew how tempted our heart would be to be in control and to know the future. And so he comes along and he says, don't worry. What? What do you mean, don't worry? He certainly says more than don't worry. He tells you not to lust, not to hate, not to kill, not to steal. But then he goes down to the granular level and he says, do not worry. Why? Because Jesus' point is to show us that what we are naturally given to, worry, anxiety, fear, leads us down a path that will cripple our lives, rob us of our joy, and zap us of kingdom purpose. Now, you and I can't control the circumstances we live in. Right now, you may be in a very, very anxious season. People are being laid off at your work. You have no control over it. You have a diagnosis coming up. You're not sure what it is, but the doctor wants to sit down with you, and you know you have a line of people in your family who have had cancer, who have had dementia, who have had some crippling ailment. So while we may not be able to control the circumstance we're living in, we can control what we think about, what we stay our mind on, what we focus on, and what we allow our heads to be filled with. 
So I just want to show you real quick how often the Bible talks about worry and anxiety. We'll talk a little bit about those two ideas. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, this is not going to be our passage for today. I'll teach more deeply through Philippians 4, 6 through 7 in a couple of weeks when we, hit, when we deal with anxiety head on. Today we're dealing more with worry, the momentary day-to-day worries. Paul said, do not be anxious about anything, nothing. There's no exception. Paul's writing to Christians who would, some of them would die for their faith. And he's like, don't be anxious about that. Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The first thing Paul says is you want to combat anxiety? You want to combat these anxious feelings? Hey, are you praying and are you thanking God? I'm just telling you, when we start thanking God, writing out prayer lists of things we're thankful for, we, our minds will be put at ease and rest because we'll be reminded of how good God has been, therefore how good God is, and that must mean how good God will be. But he says don't be anxious about this. Instead, focus that energy on prayer. Focus that energy on thanking God. And he says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. That's what we want, but you can't get there without skipping. You can't get there by skipping prayer and thanksgiving, which surpasses all understanding. will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word guard is doing a lot of work in this passage. It's not the idea that when I do this, anxiety's gone forever. No, it's constantly wanting to come back. And you're going to have to put your heart on guard. So what it is, is the peace of God begins to guard your heart as you pray and you spend time with him. God wants more than just to save your soul and be like, all right, hold still. When I come back, you'll be okay. When you get to heaven, you'll be okay. Jesus wants us to live real life free of worry and anxiety that cripples so many humans. Isaiah 41.10, the Lord said to Israel, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. First Peter 5, 7, Peter said, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Peter was not only facing persecution, he would give his life for his faith, but he knew that he could cast his cares. He could lay his burdens at Jesus' feet. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Even the Old Testament proclaims that we are here to encourage one another. Some of you came to church this morning and And it wasn't because you need a word from the Lord from the pastor. Some of you come every week and it has nothing to do with, this isn't the most beautiful building you're going to walk into this week. It's not because our coffee in the lobby is the best coffee in the lobby you've ever had. You come to church because you know there's a brother or sister here that is going to pray for you, that's going to love you, that's going to encourage you, that's going to put their arm around you and say, brother, been praying for you, know you had a doctor's appointment, how did it go? That's what unites us. That's why when the pastor preaches a dud, the song was just a little off, the building was a little too hot or a little too cold, that's why we gather sometimes because we need one another. So when the anxieties and the worries begin to cripple us, the word tells us a good word makes them glad. I just want you to hear this. I love seeing y'all week to week. Some of you are walking through things that I've never had to walk through and watching you put your faith on display encourages me and gives me boldness and trust knowing that I can trust the Lord if he is staying you through what you are walking through right now. And then in Matthew Chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus says it this way. This ain't Paul, this ain't Peter, this ain't Moses, this is Jesus himself. He says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Pastor, is it a sin to worry? Jesus says, don't do it. So I'm just going to tell you, when we do something he says not to do, it reveals a lack of trust in what Jesus is teaching us here. He says, for tomorrow, be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is the day of its own trouble. Jesus is so smart. He's like, some of y'all worried about tomorrow. You better be worried about today. He's not actually saying to worry about today. He's just saying, you have no control over tomorrow. Don't let tomorrow rob you of today. Tomorrow's going to have trouble. You know what Jesus is really saying? There's going to be suffering tomorrow too. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came and died and rose But the reason there had to be a gospel is because sin wrecked everything. And Jesus rose so that we can kingdom live. We can live in the kingdom here and now and in the future. But sin is still present and so is suffering and so is death. And it's actually Matthew chapter 6 where I want to focus the most of our attention. Verse 34 is where Jesus like peaks the teaching. I want want you to see what led him there. Turn back with me to verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. We'll read just a few verses. We'll digest it. We'll read. We'll digest it. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Before we move on, just just wrestle with this truth. You are so much more than what you consume, right? Right? Your life is more than what you eat or drink, uh, buy or own. Your, your life is more than that. But sometimes that's so much of what we think about, we think that is our life. 
You know what I mean? The American consumer tends to think, I am what I drive. I am what I eat. I am the restaurants that I eat at. I am the type of food that I consume. I am what I wear. I am how I look. I am how I'm perceived. Do people think I'm smart? Do people think I'm strong? Do people think I'm wise? Do people think I'm successful? And Jesus is like, you're so much more than that. But we get so blinded because that's all we tend to see. Things to be consumed or things to put on. Ideas to pursue or ideas to become. And then Jesus does this thing that is so good. He says, look at the birds of the air. Now just imagine you're a You're a first century Hebrew, been taught the word of God your whole life. You know all of the passages of the Torah, of the Old Testament. And Jesus comes along, he's like, look at the birds. You think, what is he going to say about the birds? What is Jesus, some hippie? No, no. He's reminding you that God placed in nature little reminders of his faithfulness, but we miss it sometimes because we're so caught up in our lives. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You need to wrestle with this question. Does Jesus, does Jesus tell you this morning, do you matter more than a bird? Now, you know you do. You have a soul with eternal value to God. You, you matter. And he says, look at the birds. Now, they neither toil nor reap or have barns. This language doesn't do much for us because we don't work in that type of environment. The main worry of their day was not money, it was food. For most of human history, there was not mass production of crops and food. Now say what you will about the things we use to extend the shelf life of food. Today there's less starving than there's ever been in human history statistically. So that's the benefit. But back then everyone was working, 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 and all it took was a famine to wipe out tons of people. Or a birth rate, the birth rate plummets, and now there's not as many 20-year-olds working in the fields. Well, there's no combines. It takes 20-year-olds. we got to have them in the fields. And so there's not enough food, so everyone's got to watch what they're eating. So they're constantly, do we have food? Do we have food? Will we survive? And Jesus is like, the bird doesn't work the land. The bird doesn't own a barn. Back then, you were rich if you had a barn, man. You had months of food. Nobody had that. They, they, for, throughout human history, most humans did not have weeks of food in their pantry. We do today. We have that need answered, and yet what does our mind do? Find something else to worry about. So we don't worry about barns. We worry about 401Ks. We don't worry about fields. We worry about jobs. We worry about something different because our hearts tend to do this. And Jesus says, they're not worried. They're just living day to day. And he says, are you not of more value than they? You know what he's really saying? Those birds have more faith than you. They trust that tomorrow there'll be another worm. There'll be another bug. There'll be something else. And they live their lives freely depending on God's goodness, and you act as if God's mercies will run out. He goes on to say in verse 27, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? Jesus says, let's just give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's say you're the world's best worrier. As a matter of fact, you may be the best worrier in human history. And I just want to say, if there were a competition for worry, I would be a top 10 finalist. (laughs) Very good at it. Never walked into a situation I couldn't find something to worry about. Never walked into a room where I couldn't find something to worry about. Never been in a situation with another human where I didn't find a way to worry that they were going to somehow hurt me or I was going to somehow let them down. I'm good at it. He says, the best of the best. Could you add a single hour to your life? It's so funny now, 2,000 years later, doctors tell us worry actually does the opposite, doesn't it? It, it shortens your life. By some estimates, if you are constantly giving into worry, anxiety, and fear, it can even shave years off your life because of what it does to your blood pressure, what it does to your heart rate, what it does to your body because your body was never meant to live in a state of crisis 24-7. And some of us, the news puts us in a crisis mode 24-7. I say that well aware of the news last night. When I read that Iran had attacked Israel, I knew terrible time for me to be preaching about worry in a military town. Some of you know this means you may be getting orders. Some of you know what this is going to mean in the Middle East, around the world, at the gas pump, and yet I would remind you, 
regardless of what the news said yesterday, Jesus' words are, will worrying about it extend your life by one hour? And today we know, scientifically know, it will shorten your life. Almost like Jesus knew more about the human body than we did. So the first thing I want you to see from Jesus' teaching is worry is based on fear. It may be a fear of man. It may be a fear of lack. It may be a fear of future. It may be a fear of loss. It could just be the fear of the unknown. This is why God so often says in his word, fear not. Worry is the temporary feeling of unease, while anxiety is more of a constant. It's a never going away, numb feeling that things are going to get worse. Both of these can affect our physical bodies. So God isn't just saying like, hey, don't worry. He's saying, don't worry. It's actually killing you. Don't worry. It's actually hurting you. And what Jesus does is he points them to this bird. Now, when you think of birds, you're like, well, birds don't have a long shelf life. I got a picture of a bird I want to show you. The bird's name is Wisdom. Wisdom is the longest, I'm sorry, the oldest living bird in the wild. She's 69 when this picture was taken, 69 years old. And she looks pretty good, doesn't she? So throughout her life, she's been living in the wild. No one's fed her. No one's taken care of her, and yet she's lived to a ripe old age. She is a living illustration of what Jesus was saying. Look at those birds. Ain't nobody caring for them, and yet they're fine. Now, when Jesus was teaching, he didn't point to an albatross. She's an albatross. He didn't point to an albatross. Albatrosses don't hang out in that part of the Middle East. What is more likely is that Jesus pointed to a raven. And ravens are common, especially this type of raven in the Middle East. As a matter of fact, ravens have a little bit of biblical significance. You think of passages where, like, Noah used a raven, and other passages where it talks about the wisdom of a raven. And back then, when people said that a raven was wise, you'd think, yeah, it's a bird, big deal. Did you know? I did some reading this week. (laughs) One of the five most intelligent animals on the planet, a raven. Scientists did some studies, and they, they discovered that ravens use tools They can solve problems to get to food, and they even hold grudges. Boy, that's real smart. (laughs) I never heard of an animal so human-like in nature. And so when Jesus points out this animal, he's like, look at that thing. No barn, no work. It's doing fine. You could live like that, but you are choosing to worry yourself to death. Jesus is so good. He looks down, he sees that we're sinners lost in sin, bound up in adultery and murder and hate. He comes down not just to save us from the external sin, he also wants to free us from the bondage within, the anxiety and the worry that are robbing you of trust in God. He says, you're placing your trust in something that can't add an hour of of time to your life. Why not trust God like that? He goes on to say in verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Before I go on, I want you to think about the plant and how much much beauty comes out of a seed that's planted in the ground. My my son is three years old and my in-laws, they have an acre in Chesapeake where they grow some, uh, they grow some beans, they grow some corn, they grow, uh, they grow fruits like watermelons and they have strawberries. They grow all these different plants. They have grapes. And, and every year we get to go over and pick some of these, these, these foods and fruits and vegetables and we eat them. And my son remembers last year, he's three, he remembers harvesting those crops. But this year he went over there when they're digging the soil and he said, where, where is everything? And grandma... And Pops showed him the little seeds, and you watch his little head explode. He's like, wait a minute, wait, 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 that? And they're like, yeah, we're going to put that in the ground, and it's going to produce food. Sometimes, Jesus is pointing out, we miss the miracles of nature all around us. I heard a preacher say it this way, you know God's kingdom is the only kingdom where through consuming, you produce more? In our economy, you consume something, it's gone. You buy it, you spend it, it's done. In God's economy, you eat one apple, you get like 10 apple seeds, and you can have 10 apple trees, and you can have hundreds of apples. Consider how miraculous our planet is that God gave us, where we put a seed in the ground, and something grows up. And so Jesus draws their attention to the lilies of the field. He says, you're concerned about your clothes, what you wear, how you look? Have you seen the lilies? Now, they don't toil or spin. Now, this morning, we we didn't come here in clothes that we toiled or spin. I did not toil. I did not spin. I bought this shirt. You bought that shirt. Most of us did not make the clothes that we wear. They had to make the clothes that they wore. If you're like me, you picked up your clothes at the store, and you 
If you're like me, you didn't walk into the store and say, I'll take that, I'll take that. You said, those look nice. Let's go right. Where's that corner? You know the corner, the clearance rack. Ah, yes. I don't need this year's fashion. I need last year's fashion at a major discount. Why? Because most of us don't care too much. But some of us do. And some of them did. They were concerned about how they were perceived. And if they were able to afford the color purple and they could dye their clothes purple, people would think more highly of them. And he says, these lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, the wisest, wealthiest man you can think of, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. He comes out and says it. You got no faith. You know what Jesus is saying? That plant will not be here next year, and God put clothes on it. God made it beautiful to look at, to remind you you can trust him, and you're worried about your clothes, how you're perceived, what people see when they see you. If God gives this kind of attention to detail, you can trust him. Second thing you got to know about worry, worry reveals what I value. And you know what a lot of them were valuing? How they were perceived, how they looked, how people thought about them. Many of us, just like the listeners back then, are so concerned with how we look or how we're perceived that we focus on things we have no control over. Well, I don't look as young as I used to, and you won't 10 years from now either. <laughs> Y'all weren't in first service. First service, past, past, first service, Terry said, yeah, Pastor Mark, you know, he looked so young. I heard that. <laughs> then he said, then he said, yeah, yeah, he looked like a little kid when he used to dress real nice. Used to, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's coming for all of us, and we might as well embrace it. And Jesus is saying, some of you are so concerned with how you look, you're missing the reality of your life. You're placing all the value of your life in what people think about you, whether that's your career, what you wear, how you look, how in shape you are or aren't, how smart people think you are or aren't. And I'm not saying to act like a dope. I'm not saying not to take care of your body. I'm saying those can't be the primary force, driving force of your life. And here's why. Because those things will always peak and begin to descend. Whether it's your physical body, your fashion. And what Jesus says is what you're valuing is all wrong. And then he does this thing. He's already pointed them to the birds, which more often than not, you hear birds before you see them. And now he's going to point them to something they will often see. He points them to the lilies of the field. According to John Chancellor in his book, The Flowers and Fruits of the Bible, This plant, this flower, the poppy anemone, is more than likely the flower that Jesus pointed out. It covers the ground with brilliant blossom every early spring in the Middle East. It's the most vibrant of all the spring flowers in this region of the world. Whenever you walk around the Holy Land in this season, you will see the olives and the thistles and the wild grass, but then you'll be hit with an unexpected flash of color, this anemone. God gave them, and God gives us visual reminders. You know, this morning on my way to church, I didn't see these plants specifically, but I saw a lot of flowers in bloom. Did you? There's cherry blossoms that are blooming right now. In my neighborhood, there are dogwoods, and the white flowers are not only blossoming when the wind blows, it's blowing them down the street. And there's this reminder all through the spring, all through. You come up on the property this morning, the grass was green, the flowers are in bloom. It's a beautiful reminder That winter came, but winter's over, and now this life is springing forward from the dirt, the dust. And it's God saying, if I can be trusted to make dirt beautiful, you can trust me with what you put on. You can trust me with how you look or how you're perceived. Jesus goes on in verse 31. Therefore, if the birds can trust God and they've got food, If the flowers are more beautiful than you could ever be, working your skin to the bones, making yourself appear to be something you're not. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? I find it interesting. These are the three biggest arguments with every couple every Friday night. Where should we go? What should we wear? 
I don't care what you wear, just get in the car. He says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. In this case, he's not referencing their ethnicity. He's more or less saying their unbelief. Unbelievers worry about these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. And then verse 33, here's the key. You know the verse well if you've been in church any length of time. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, Jesus puts them in their proper place. Your clothes, your appearance, your stuff, your career. Guys, I'm not belittling these things. Jesus just says, those things will be added to you. Verse 34, where we started. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, that teaches us number three. Worry to Jesus is a waste of time. It's not worth doing. Because what worry does is it wastes time that I could be seeking the kingdom, that I could be honoring God, that I could be making a difference in the lives of others. Jesus is in no way belittling our circumstance. I got a picture I want to show you before we move on. Matthew's chapter 8 through 9, Jesus lays out. So in 6, he's telling you, don't be anxious. But then in Matthew's chapters 8 and 9, he lays out all these different ways that he meets with people who are in suffering. There's 10 different conversations where he meets with people, groups of people who are facing anxious circumstances. He knew what they were facing. One of them is a man with leprosy. One of them is a man with a sick daughter. One of them is one who is facing death. Another is somebody who's poor. Another is somebody who's hungry. He's dealing with these people. In Matthew chapter 8 and 9, he has a conversation with them. He stops what he's doing. He sits down and spends time with them. Why? Because their problems matter, but he wants to help them through their issue and move them on to kingdom living. Don't miss this. When you and I give in to worry and we allow worry to waste our time, we are wasting energy and misplacing our values in such a way where the kingdom takes a back seat to me. What is the kingdom of God? There's so much kingdom of God work to be done. Honoring Jesus and following in his work in the kingdom of God is honoring God first and others and then myself. And when all I'm doing is worrying about myself, I have no time for others because I'm worried about me. I have no time to honor God because don't you know what's happening to me? And yet some of the most faithful believers, joyful Christians I know who have walked through the darkest of days, they've walked through suffering with joy in their hearts. When I talk to them, you know the first thing they bring up? Not themselves, other people. My sister's really suffering. Our brother in Christ is dealing with this. I've got a missionary family that I've been praying for. Why? Because somewhere along the way, they realized that worrying about their own stuff was a waste of time. I'm going to pursue the kingdom. And the kingdom always reorients you. As Terry said earlier, it takes you from selfishly living for me to loving God and others in such a way that is beautiful, it's radical, and it's where real living is. This is what Jesus wants to move us to. There's so much kingdom work to be done, but we often miss it because we can't see past the fear we're worrying through at the moment. Worry reveals my trust is lacking, it stagnates my spiritual growth, and it paralyzes my kingdom potential. So when Satan can't sideline me with sin, gross, outward sin, he'll settle for doubt, fear, and especially worry. Because if he can just get me so focused on myself, so focused on my problems, he knows I often won't see the person struggling next to me at work. I often won't notice what my kids are going through and they need my help. I often won't notice the gospel opportunities in my neighborhood. And so worry is this big time waster. And Jesus says, focus on the kingdom. These other things will work out. They often do, but we're like, no, no. If I worry, it's going to help. If I worry, it's going to be better. And we exhaust ourselves worrying. And Jesus says, you can trust me with that too. You can trust me with your soul. You can trust me with your money. You can trust me with your time. You can trust me with your life because it's short. The apostle Paul says it's like a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And we think worrying is going to make it last longer. And with that being said, I'm going to tell you why and how I worry and why, how I've gotten so good at it and how the Lord has been helping me through it. But in order to do it, I've got to share with you a story that's three years in the making. And I'm going to ask them to turn the live stream off because I don't want this to be edited, taken out of context, and a lot of this 